Hey there, stand-up listeners. If you're a regular or even just a casual listener to this podcast, you'll want to check out our live event happening this spring. The Stand-Up Pod Jam, Saturday, March 23rd in Las Vegas. General admission tickets start at just $25. Beginning at 10 a.m., you could be part of the live podcast audience. Then round off the day with some comedy and music. Featuring frequent guests and funny humans, J.L. Covan, Ophira Eisenberg, Christian Finnegan, and even Pete himself. As well as musical guests, Gareth Sever of comedy percussion group Buckets and Boards. And Grammy Award winning songwriter John Carroll. It's Stand Up with Pete Dominic Live, the Stand Up Pod Jam. Follow the link in the show notes for more info and to purchase your tickets now. Yeah, thank you, Pete Cole. Let's do a show. Stand up. Yeah, and we are off. It is the 13th of February, one day before Valentine's Day, and a snow day here just north of New York City where we're expected to get anywhere from six to nine inches of snow, and I love it. I like it. Drop it all on my coordinates right on my location. Bring it. I hope you're doing okay. I am very excited to share my conversation with Bill Boyle. Bill B. in D.C. Smart, as always, we talked Ukraine and politics and history and democracy, the current state of things. Always great to talk with Bill Boyle anytime. You can listen to that conversation beginning at 27 minutes into today's show. But I'd love for you to stay here because I've got your headlines and a whole bunch of audio clips, as I always do. So I want to get right into it, shall we? Well, I want to start in Washington, where 18 Senate Republicans are expected to buck the rest of the party and join Democrats in advancing a $95 billion foreign aid package, which includes assistance for Ukraine and Israel. The legislation would direct around $60 billion towards helping Ukraine fight off Russia's invasion, $14 billion to Israel's war against Hamas, and almost $10 billion towards humanitarian aid for civilians in conflict zones, including Palestinians in Gaza, which is it's just weird to be giving Israel all that money to destroy the Palestinians and then give the Palestinians all the humanitarian money to uh, it's it's a tough thing to, uh, to understand the Ukraine money uh, far less controversial I think it's fair to say but still the package is opposed by the majority of Republican senators and Republican leaders in the House and obviously their daddy Donald Trump the support from Republicans mainly these national security hawks uh, like Mitt Romney and others would put the package on the track with pass the Senate within days but there's Tons of reporting now that House Speaker Mike Johnson warned the House is unlikely to take up the the bill that may pass the Senate, which is, of course, a massive blow to what some lawmakers view as their their last shot to pass a comprehensive package this year that includes aid to Ukraine. So Mike Johnson puts out a statement yesterday criticizing the lack of border security provisions in the bill, which is on set to, again, pass the Senate Wednesday morning. The Senate's foreign aid bill is silent on the most pressing issue facing our country, he said. Mike Johnson warned that in the absence of having received any single border policy change from the Senate, the House will have to continue to work on its own will on these important matters. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go hurt myself for having impure thoughts. Now, of course, the legislation was drawn up after Senate Republicans largely rejected a package that included border security provisions. The new version of the Senate bill includes, as I said, funding for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, Palestinian civilians, and more. And now, I guess the only thing that's left is a potential maneuver in the House, where Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries signaled in a statement last week that Democrats may attempt to force the bill to the floor through a discharge petition. I talk about that with Bill B in D.C. because we found out that Republican congressman from Wisconsin, Mike Gallagher, has announced that he is going not to run for another term. He's resigning, and he may force that discharge petition at least that's what Bill's hearing, and uh, some of us, you know, it's doubtful, but always possible is uh, the reporting from Axios, at least from one, quote, centrist House Republican. So that is a huge story about basically what's not happening as a result of Daddy Trump not wanting any progress to be made unless he is the president of the United States, and then he can call it progress, I guess. But it's, it's just incredible. Sawyer Hackett, who is Democratic strategist, I saw tweeting, after Republicans abandoned the immigration deal on Trump's orders, Mike Johnson now says the House won't take up the rest of the Senate's aid package for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. His justification, the legislation fails to address America's border crisis. We tried to address America's border crisis. You wouldn't even 
hear, take the, a vote on the bill. As always, Republicans, they don't want a solution to the problem because it might be solved and then they don't have a problem to divide us over and get reelected or elected to office, get ratings on all their bullshit shows. They don't want solution to the problem. It's anti-American. What a weak sack of Republicans, the weakest cowards we've ever seen in the halls of Congress. I am so pissed about this, and I hope that you are as well. And I hope it moves you to do something, even if it moves you to do something local, to crush these terribly dangerous ideologies that are so pervasive on the modern right and Republican Party. I mean, more than any of the foreign aid, I'm pissed about the border bill and that it was theirs. So then they wrote it and then they shot it down themselves. But obviously, the Ukraine aid is a huge, huge setback, and we'll follow closely what happens to that. Bill B. talks a lot about what's going on there during our conversation today. In other news, the woman who opened fire at a Houston megachurch, Joel Osteen's church yesterday, she was carrying an AR-15. She had her kid with her. The kid got shot in the head. Uh, she's dead. And on her weapon, there was a sticker that simply said Palestine. Apparently, her ex-husband is Jewish. Apparently, she had all kinds of mental issues. Apparently, some were violent. She had former weapons charges. She had like fall, four calls to child protection services. The idea that this woman got a gun and apparently legally is the only thing that matters here. It's just crazy. That's Texas for you. But still, I mean, I, I feel like that's a story. A lot is being made of it. What her political motivations may or may not have been. And if she is an anti-Semite or if she's mad at her Jewish husband and she's taken it out, who knows how she's been radicalized or influenced. But nonetheless, it just shows that people continue to target others because of their religion, specifically Jews and Muslims in America. And I mean, this was a Christian church, Joel Osteen's church. And it's hard to understand, but it's clear that she had some real serious issues, apparently with even with schizophrenia. I mean, the idea that she got uh, a gun is just really so much all of the problem, really. What else do I have for you? The chief executives of three major pharmaceutical companies appeared before the Senate Health Committee, drawing them further into a confrontation with lawmakers at the White House over the cost of medications. See if I can find any audio clips of that. At the White House yesterday, President Joe Biden was hosting the Jordan uh, Jordan's King Abdullah the second. Two leaders discussed the ongoing effort to free hostages held in Gaza and growing concern over a possible Israeli military operation in the border city of Rafah. The first meeting between the Jordanian leadership, the allies, since three American troops were killed last month in a drone strike against a U.S. base in Jordan. Ukraine, Russia launched a drone attack on the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, killing seven people, including three small children, triggering blazes and damaging infrastructure and residential houses, according to officials on Saturday. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was recently under general anesthesia for non-surgical procedures, according to a statement released by the Pentagon on Monday. The procedures were related to a bladder issue after Lloyd Austin uh, was hospitalized and then admitted to a critical care unit on Sunday, apparently handover duties to his deputy. And on the way to the hospital this time, he called the White House and, uh, and made sure that they knew based on the last time. Apparently, he, he didn't clue them in that he had cancer. Thoughts and prayers for Lloyd Austin. In Lansing, Michigan, hey, Matty C., a Republican lawmaker lost his committee assignment and staff days after posting an image of a racist ideology on social media. State Rep. Josh Shriver, do we know him? White guy, shared a post on Twitter formerly, and in the post, it, it had a map of the world with black figures greatly outnumbering white figures, along with the phrase, quote, the great replacement. So apparently, Rep. Josh Shriver He's, he's still there. He's still in the Michigan State House legislature. Uh, apparently, he lost the committee assignment. But, yeah. Huh. We'll follow that story for you with our correspondence in Lansing. Get on it, Matty Carlson. And newly unearthed footage from January 6, 2021, appears to show a rioter, a man identified on NBC News Story nearly two years ago, firing a gun into the air outside the Capitol. So next time some Republican apologist for January 6th insists the riders weren't armed, uh, show them that video. Not that it'll make any difference to them. And on Friday, Meta, the uh, parent program, the corporate entity that runs Facebook and Instagram, announced it would stop proactively recommending political content on Instagram for its upstart text-based app Threads, which I'm on. Alarming news and politics focused creators and journalists like myself uh, that are gearing up for a crucial election year that they are no longer going to be recommending any of that content on 
Instagram or threads. So I guess that means they still will on Facebook, but not great for people who do what I do. So tell your friends to come on over here to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we've got these headlines every day up by 12 midnight or 6 a.m., hopefully at the latest most days and always the best guests analyzing what's happening in the world around us as well as inside of us. I mean, you know, we do health, we do emotional and psychological stuff. Sometimes I'm always willing to have uh, serious and important conversations on how we can all navigate this wild ride of life. Very happy to be on it with you. If you're not a member of our community, we'd love to have you sign up right now. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic and get access to this amazing community of folks. We're going to meet up uh, together in person in Vegas. Lots of folks are coming. Hundreds of people I know I've heard from are going to come and I'm really excited about that. And of course, you can always hang out with us on Thursday nights at our hangouts and on the discord platform anytime, which is just a big old chat box. Just jump in there and say hello. And you're never alone if you're a member of the stand up community. Now let's get to some of the audio clips I've got for you from yesterday, ending hopefully with something from the daily show. I'm producing this late on Monday night in hopes to catch John Stewart's Debut back at The Daily Show behind the desk for Monday nights, apparently. Let's start with some comments from the Senate floor last night during debate about the bill to supplement aid to Ukraine. Republican Senator Mitt Romney, who's on his way out, gave a powerful speech that is getting a lot of plaudits from across the political spectrum about the importance of U.S. standing with Ukraine and our NATO allies. The vote we will soon take to provide military weapons for Ukraine is the most important vote we will ever take as United States senators. We're not being asked to send American troops into war. We are asked to help the Ukrainians defend themselves. If we fail to help Ukraine, Putin will invade a NATO nation. He may delay his next invasion until he rebuilds his decimated military. But we must be clear-eyed Ukraine is not the end. It is a step. If we fail to help Ukraine, China will eventually absorb Taiwan. If we fail to help Ukraine, we will abandon our word and our commitment, providing to our friends a view that America cannot be trusted. The Chinese Communist Party is already spreading propaganda using our delay as a warning to Taiwan that the United States will not be there to help in the face of China's threat. If we fail to help Ukraine, NATO, the alliance that's prevented great power conflict for over 75 years, will falter and eventually disintegrate. If we fail to help Ukraine... America will cease to be the arsenal of democracy. It will cease to be the leader of the free world. We will be replaced by the authoritarians, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. If we fail to help the Ukraine, we will be known not as our fathers and mothers were, the greatest generation, but as the worst generation. Wow, the worst generation. Mitt Romney. I think we already are, or at least they are. He is a member. Sorry, if you're a member of it. Worst generation. Certainly, generation of congressmen. that will be nicer. All right, so that's uh, Mitt Romney. Now let's check in with another Republican who holds a different view, the super masculine senator from Missouri, this is Josh Hawley. And I have listened carefully, carefully, to colleague after colleague of mine come to this floor and stand where I am now and say, it's so important that we spend this money on these overseas wars. We must spend the money. If we don't spend this money now, why, it may cost us more money in the future. No, it's it's imperative. It's imperative that we spend this money. Meanwhile, these same people turn to the citizens of Missouri and say, you're not worth a dime. Okay. They say, you can't have a penny. What? They turn to the residents of Kentucky and Tennessee and Alaska. And- all right. I don't know what he's talking about. They all get money. Everybody gets money. Everybody's getting money. They get more money than they uh, deserve, those red states. What's he talking about? 
All right, let's listen to a senator from Washington. This is Patty Murray for a minute. Ukraine, what is an inconvenient delay for the United States Senate is a dangerous one for our allies in Ukraine. Putin's forces are on the march as we speak. Ukrainians are fighting bravely to defend their homeland, but they are running lower and lower on bullets, air defense missiles, and more every day. We measure time in hours. They are measuring it at how many bullets they have left, how many more missiles fall on their cities, and how much closer Putin's tanks are getting. The question for us is how long is this going to take? The question for them is how much longer can they hold out? We cannot leave them waiting. So I urge my colleagues to support moving forward on these votes, vote to waive the budget point of order, and let's keep this bill moving. And once we get it through the Senate, we're going to push every way we can to get this to the president's desk and signed into law. Yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to happen. I don't see it. I hope I uh, hope I'm wrong. Uh, and then finally, uh, one more senator. This is Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio. He got finished with his ar- with his argument and then he used uh, the rest of the time to read Dr. Seuss to his son. Waiting for the fish to bite or waiting for the wind to fly a kite or waiting around for Friday night. Or waiting, perhaps, for their Uncle Jake. Or a pot to boil, or a better break. Or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants. Or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. Okay, well, that's nice. Isn't that sweet? He's, he seems like a really a really sweet guy. J.D. Vance, Senator Vance of, of Ohio. All right, and I do have to play you one more senator, actually. I know I said finally. But this is uh, Chris Van Hollen, who yesterday took to the Senate floor. He's one of the most... Respected Democrats when it comes to foreign policy, and it seems like a pretty big deal moment that he was critical of Israel, uh, that he's paying attention and and doesn't want to look away. But U.S. Senator Chris Van Hollen accusing the Israeli government of war crimes and says its leaders are war criminals. I mean, listen to this. Madam President, I want that to sink in. Kids in Gaza are now dying from the deliberate withholding of food. In addition to the horror of that news, one other thing is true. That is a war crime. It is a textbook war crime. And that makes those who orchestrate it war criminals. Damn. So now the question is, what will the United States do? What will we do? What will President Biden do? President Biden must take action in response to what is happening. Wow. No matter what you think about the the war, to hear a U.S. senator be so critical of Israel, that's a, it's a really big deal. I'm now seeing breaking news, by the way, that Donald Trump has endorsed uh, the North Carolina Republican Party chairman Michael Watley to be the RNC chair and his daughter-in-law to be the co-chair. He's endorsed Lara Trump, Eric Trump's wife and North Carolina Republican Party chairman as co-chairs of the RNC. Oh, good grief. What a terribly unethical, horrible thing. If any other American did any such thing, it would be seen as a Major, major scandal to even suggest the idea that you would put a family member, a quote, loyalist, a henchman, a party head, a captain, whatever you want to call it, the head of the RNC. That is really, well, on brand. All right, let's get back to audio. And here is President Biden yesterday at the White House when he was meeting with King Abdullah II of Jordan. He talked about how many Palestinians have been killed in this conflict. Let's take a listen to those comments. The past months, as the war has raised, the Palestinian people have also suffered unimaginable pain and loss. Too many, too many of the over 27,000 Palestinians killed in this conflict have been innocent civilians and children, including thousands of children. And hundreds of thousands have no access to food, water, or other basic services. Many families have lost not just one, but many relatives and cannot mourn for them, even bury them, because they're not safe to do so. 
It's heartbreaking. There you go. A little bit more from the president. He talked about uh, working on a, a hostage deal. Not only do we pray for peace, we're actively working for peace, security and dignity for both the Palestinian people and the Israeli people. And I'm working on this day and night with the king and others in the region to find the means to bring all these hostages home, to ease the humanitarian crisis and to end the terror threat and to bring peace to Gaza and Israel, enduring peace with the two-state solution for two peoples. As the King and I discussed today, the United States is working on a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, which would bring an immediate and sustained period of calm to Gaza for at least six weeks, which we could then take the time to build something more enduring. Over the past month, I've had calls with Prime Minister Netanyahu, as well as the leaders of Egypt and Qatar, to push this forward. The key element of the deals are on the table. There are gaps that remain, but I've encouraged Israeli leaders to keep working to achieve the deal. The United States will do everything possible to make it happen. All right. The president yesterday at the White House. He also made jokes uh, about his age and memory. How about that, huh? But I didn't realize, and I've been around, I know I don't look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> he remembers that he's, he's been around a while. Yeah, National Association of Counties was where he was speaking when he made those comments. And then there's this guy, trigger alert to my friend Tina, who doesn't like to hear his voice. Nikki Haley has been in the pocket of the open borders establishment donors her entire career, and uh, she's a globalist, you know, she likes the globe. I like (laughs) America first. (laughs) She likes the globe. Fucking idiot. She likes the globe. She's a globalist. Uh, And here is Nikki Haley talking to Jake Tapper on CNN yesterday. And that's what I'm trying to tell Republicans right now. This is the time that we need to be sober and start realizing what we need to do to fix things. We can't continue. You look at what happened last week. Here, Trump loses the immunity battle. He'll now be citizen Trump. Republicans lose the situation with the border. They lose the situation with Israel. The RNC chair loses her job. The RNC is broke. Trump has spent $50 million in campaign donations on his personal legal fees. That is not the, that is not what you need to win an election. And it's a pattern of losing that everything he touches he loses. We saw it in 2018. We saw it in 2020. We saw it in 2022. How many more times? Do we have to go back to the same person and say, and then finally decide maybe he's the problem? Because I know he's the problem. Now we need the rest of America to get in a, in a voter booth and show that he's the problem. A voter booth. Yep. Well, there you go. A little too late to go so hard, Nikki. And finally, here's some laughs. John Stewart made his debut back at the Despie at the Daily Show with their election coverage kickoff. And he did a bit of a wellness check on America's two chronologically challenged candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Some people are criticizing him for uh, going after both sides like it's a false equivalency. But I think it probably is a good idea. It's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe people who trust John Stewart will see him as not being so partisan. I don't know. What do you think? These two candidates, they are both similarly challenged. And it is not crazy to think that the oldest people in the history of the country to ever run for president might have some of these challenges. Now, Democrats will say that any criticism like this, especially of Biden, is unfair because you just don't know Biden like they know Biden. President Biden, who I've been around uh, numerous times just in this last year, is sharp. He's focused. He's bright. He is sharp intensely probing and detail-oriented and focused. This is a man who is sharp, who is on top of his game, who knows what's going on. He's smart. He's on his game. I was in almost every meeting with the president, and the president was in front of and on top of it all, coordinating and directing leaders who are in charge of America's national security, not to mention our allies around the globe. Did anyone film that? (laughs) Because if you're... 
If you're telling us behind the scenes he is sharp and full of energy and on top of it and really in control and leading, you should film that. <laughs> that would be good to show to people <laughs> instead of a TikTok where he goes, chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> We see he's in charge. You see, I like cookies. (laughs) Of course, when it comes to Republicans, they've got a different strategy for their 77-year-old candidate. Well, first of all, Donald Trump is not an old man. He's an old man! (laughs) He is objectively an old man on a human scale. Trump is objectively old. If he was a tortoise... I would tell him as a tortoise at 77, oh, young man, go off and enjoy college. (laughs) But he's not a tourist. He's not a tortoise. That is not being ageist. That is being human (laughs) lifespan-ist. One thing we know for certain is this. We have two candidates who are chronologically outside the norm of anyone who has run uh, for the presidency in this country, in the history of this country. They are the oldest people ever to run for president, breaking by only four years the record that they set (laughs) the last time they ran. They are at the age, they are objectively old, they're at the age, there are no more age-related milestones to hit. They got the RRP card. They've got Social Security. They've got their movie discounts. There is no, oh, wait till you hit 88. You get to drink and drive. No. <laughs> All right. There it is. More on YouTube, Comedy Central Daily Show. John Stewart is back. And so is Bill B. Bill Boyle. Bill Boyle in D.C. He is one of my favorite people to talk to. Always love talking to him. You should follow him on Blue Sky on Twitter. Check him out if you're in D.C. That is the news for you. Let's get to it. My conversation with Bill B. in D.C. There he is, the Boyle of Billiams. William Boyle, Bill B. D.C. Good to see you. Thank you for agreeing to negotiations today. Yeah, good to talk to you as well, sir. Uh, things are really they're pretty busy. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of things. Apparently in your in your town or in your area, I had no idea about this stadium controversy. And so can you can you explain it and why it's interesting or important to, to know what's happening? Sure. So the worst team in the NBA, the Washington Wizards, the worst named and also the worst playing team in the <laughs> NBA, and the ice hockeys, the Capitals, all play downtown right on the – Carter of like seven The NBA team NBA and, the, and the ice hockey team play in the same arena downtown. They do. Yeah. 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 And it's right downtown. It's this anchor thing for a whole bunch of Chinatown in DC produces, you know, a hundred events a year is the reason for many restaurants to be there, et cetera. Well, our, the owner of the team <clears throat> has seemed to figure out how he can get out of his lease. And At the behest of the Republican governor of Virginia, Greg Youngkin, he's going to go across the river to a place called called Potomac Yards. And the reason he's going to go, they they did all this. And this is where it gets interesting about the things I care about. The justification for it was there was too much crime in downtown D.C., that the city was unreasonable, that the mayor wasn't negotiating in good faith, all this other bullshit. The reality is that he was offered the most, the owner of the team's, was offered the most one-sided agreement ever in the history of moving a team anywhere. It's a thing called a TIF, and a TIF is basically a taxpayer-funded bond. Yeah. He's getting a three billion with a B dollar TIF to move to a place where it's right next to the airport. It's on a single metro line that has one escalator at the exit you need to get in, get to and from the stadium. Oh, we'll through the they'll, the they'll, stadium. they'll build new access. No, it's actually not very easy to do. And, and again, that gets at what I do for a living. It's not actually very easy to, you know, you still have one line in, one line out. That's it. So you can build a couple of extra escalators. That doesn't make the trains any bigger or faster. Whereas the stadium is now, it's got multiple train lines. It's right in the center of the region. It's perfect. But it, it's this really hilariously ridiculous sellout by a state just to get a team it's going to be one of the hardest places to get to in the district, in the whole region. So it's going to hurt their attendance. And hilariously, it looked like it was going to sell through the Virginia legislature, except that Greg Youngkin, Clint, 
who is not worst, nearly as smart you're, as you're, you're worse than Biden and Trump put together with getting names right. You keep saying Greg Youngkin. I would I would oh, never make a mistake. Oh, Glenn Youngkin. Yeah, it's like it's like Dave Phillips. You know, I, these guys are all it's, just sort of yeah. Glenn, out, it doesn't out, really out, matter. We know, we know exactly right? who you're talking about. <laughs> I'll, I'll call him Governor okay. Youngkin. How's that? Okay. So Governor Youngkin gave a speech the other day where he said, Virginia Democrats don't care about America and its place in the world. <laughs> and a bunch, of, a bunch of Virginia senators, Democratic huh. senators, in a committee today said, you know what? Fuck really? you. And they killed the bill that was going to pass the tip. Because of his, because of his shitty rhetoric about well, them? It's they have a lot of good reasons for killing it, some of which I've mentioned, some of which is that these are senators from Tidewater that are not going to benefit from it in any way. And they're seeing three billion dollars being spent in Northern Virginia, which drives them crazy. But Yunkin, Glenn, Greg, George, whatever the fuck his name is, he he just gave them a reason. And it's amazing. And it's like it gets at sort of the it's this whole mix of our sort of MAGA politics that. These fears of crime, these terrors about going into the city, this total disrespect for the other party who you need to get shit done. Right. And just this idea that they're going to make these big grand gestures and that it's sort of like big gesture of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the stadium in dot, dot, dot success. And that's not how the world works. And it's kind of in a, it's in a nutshell, sort of the, the malignant cancers that run through the Republican project right now are being played out in Washington and Northern Virginia's stadium controversy right now. Um, I still think eventually they'll go because I think someone will figure out a way to pony up $3 billion. The teams will, but I, I think they're just going to do it in such a ham-fisted way. It probably will. DC will be happy to see the back of them when it's all well, done. Well, we will have to watch that space, huh? I said it. hate that phrase. It's, it's something to look at Youngkin, who wants to run for president in 2028, and when people tell you, oh, he's like the, he's built, he's built for running for president, yeah. he's really not. He's actually a bit of a clown. And an extremist that just wears a vest and looks, and doesn't, yeah. That's right. That's right. He's a sweater vest yeah. extremist. No doubt about it. All right. So let's get into a bunch of the other things I wanted to talk with you about. Of course, the controversy, the scandal over the disgraced former president's comments about NATO. Trump was in a rally in, I think, uh, South Carolina over the weekend where everybody at this point probably has heard, but he basically said, you know, these other NATO countries, they're not paying their dues. And I think Russia should come in. He basically invited them. I think sometimes people, I should have the exact quote here in front of me, but the concept of it is really, what words do you want to use to describe the consequences of of his words. I mean, I, I guess I suppose you could just quote NATO leadership, European leadership. But how, how do you? How, oh, you can quote me. I got. Yeah, some go thoughts. ahead. What do you? Yeah. Think, how do you? Yeah. How do you? In, in the so, in the whole you know library of of his comments on this on NATO on Russia, where does this fit? Well, so he said he would tell Russia to do whatever the hell it wants to. That's right. the quote. There you go. And I, I, it's. It's nauseating. It's utterly stupid. It is absolutely <clears throat> appalling. And, and, and here's why. All right. Everyone gets into this whole thing. They talk about alliances and they go, oh, you know, America needs our alliances to get along in the world and to do well, et cetera. I think that is bad because it doesn't put it into concrete terms for people that they really understand. When Trump says, let Russia do whatever it wants to do, right? What he's saying is that he thinks it's okay for Russia to attack the, the countries which we do 50% of our national trade with and from which we get 50% of all the foreign investment that comes into the United States. And that is jobs, prosperity, technology, that Mercedes you like to buy. All those things are put at stake when you say, I'm not going to defend these people. I mean, it would be the equivalent of, you know, you are a, I don't know, a restaurant next to a school and you get filled full of kids who come to lunch every day and the school starts burning down and you won't, you let them use your hose, right? Which, by the way, is exactly the metaphor that Franklin Delano Roosevelt used in 1939, right? Hmm. right? When he set up Lend-Lease, like 
Your neighbor's house is burning down. You depend on each other. If his house burns down, eventually your house is going to burn down. So while it's appalling and everything else, it is just, and, and I'm, I hope that people who like Trump occasionally listen to your podcast, because what I want to tell them, the message I want them to hear is that if you think that's okay, you are a fucking idiot. You're an idiot who has no business voting for anything for anybody for any time, at any time because you're ruining yourself and you're doing it for vibes. You're doing it because you don't like brown people. You're doing it because you resent your brother-in-law who moved to Manhattan or <laughs> you're mad that the Indian guy who moved in down the streets a doctor, <laughs> right? You're ruining your own country, your own economy, your own, the American way. You're destroying it over the pettiest and fucking most picky and resentments in the world. Well, what if, and I'm, I'm sorry, mad that my doc, my doctor is an actual <laughs> Indian. Is that different? As an American Indian or or he's Southwest Asian. He's Indian. an Iroquois, and he's not even an MD. Oh, that is amazing. And he treats me yeah. with basically the sap of an oak tree, no matter what is wrong. But that's neither here nor there. Pete, I am sure that I am sure that MAGA people would probably resent him too. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, so, so like when Trump says these things, right, it is, and by the way, like some facts to throw out there. Basically, every single frontline NATO state facing Russia is spending a lot more than 2% yeah. on their defense. All of them are, right? The countries, Germany is not paying 2%, but Germany has given your, Ukraine a lot more in terms of financial help and aid in general than we have to Ukraine. Britain is not a 2%, but Britain's gotten way more to Ukraine than we get as a, percent, as a percentage of their economy. So, so you know, it's such a simplistic bullshit thing. And it's simplistic and bullshit because Trump doesn't really care. Trump has always wanted to get out of NATO. He's been talking about getting out of NATO since 1997. And he means to do it. And he means to destroy a world that is designed for you and me and every American we know. To I, I think I, I'm going to push back. I think you're giving him strangely too much credit because I think that it's easy to look and analyze at Trump's worldview and why he admires strongmen. But I think the difference between Putin and Orban or Putin and Kim Jong-un or Putin and Duterte or, or the Brazilian president, what was his name? Jose Diaz Balart. Oh, no, that's an MSNBC anchor. Uh, yeah. Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. The difference is Putin will help him win again. He will interfere in our election. He will specifically. So if you really want to analyze Trump, it's easier to say he's going to do what's directly best for him versus some kind of worldview that he might agree with, with the, you know, the authoritarianism, the racism, the all of what Putin is. Really, he wants to do Putin a favor. The only thing Putin wants from America is to stay out of Europe. And what so Trump it, wants, it's always transactional, is he wants Putin to interfere in the election to help him again. Right. So I don't I honestly am not I don't think anyone needs to go that far, even though I think it's probably true. I, I don't think we really need to go there. And I, I could tell you my answer to this comes back to Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump yeah. wrote this thing the other night about Thank how you Taylor Swift. Thanking me. I, I passed the copyright laws that she's not making you rich. Take me. In, in effect, if someone helps you get rich, you owe them. Well, Trump lived and died financially for the last 10 or 15 years. We, you don't need any conspiracy theory. It's just clear that Russian money is what made him money for the 10 or 15 years before he ran for president. And so Trump, it's just an, it's, it's both an affinity and that he believes in authoritarianism. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's also that he's like, hey, you know, these guys are, these guys paid me a lot of money. And so I need to take care of them. And on top of that, I think the final bit of it is if it's November 8th of next year, Donald Trump, knock on wood, has lost the election by a significant amount. If he's going to make a runner and try to avoid going to prison, there's not very many places he can go. And well, Russia would be all one. possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about this element of that story. And I think Brandon Friedman, who's a good follow on, on, Twitter X, whatever you shared his tweet, a lot of people saying something like this, but he writes in an explosive statement yesterday, Donald Trump encouraged Russia to attack NATO countries. There is no mention of it on today's New York Times or Washington Post front pages. It's as if it didn't happen. Instead, the top stories are about President Biden's age. Boyle, that one probably is really got your goat, it looks like. 
Well, so the bottom line is this, that we are clearly back in a situation where the media has had a not such great three years since Biden was elected because they don't have Trump to pump up their clicks and make them more money. And so the media, by and large, has a very strong motivation to to pump up Trump again. And, you know, Julia Yaffe reposted something the other day from right after the election about how bored the White House, you know, correspondents were and how they were like, man, Trump was so easy. Biden, you got to like do your job. And, you know, Julia is not somebody who critiques journalists as a matter of course, but she's putting her finger on something that's really obvious, which is that the money and thing, you know, Jim Acosta, perfectly nice guy. But is he all over the news as a defender of democracy anymore since Biden came in? No. Is anybody making themselves out as like the, you know, the latest guy to stick it to stick it to the authoritarian in the in the White House? No. These guys are returning to an industry role that was true oh, before I, I Trump, like where it's... it was much harder to be a superstar. And and Trump lets yeah. you, you know, inhabit a role and 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 become this rock star resistance guy. I think that the, and, and Biden doesn't I allow think that. that the criticism of Biden's age is fine and fair. I think that I think I that it's too. not anywhere near the I think what we're what you're what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing is that the 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 mainstream media, corporate media, DC media, they they're finding the age story a legitimate story, but they're blowing it way out of proportion versus what should get more far more attention. Which is always every yes. utterance of Trump's, which are often really incoherent themselves, obviously. But the way that they're kind of disproportionately covering the Biden age story, although they're they're legit and he keeps, you know, misspeaking and saying things and his memory and all that. But they need something to be qu- critical of him for to look like they're being fair and balanced. And they're just way overplaying it. And it doesn't they don't want to say they don't want to play the same Trump hit again and again, but it's not the same hit again and right. again. And if he says it, you got to cover it. If he says it like that, you really got to cover it. It's such a major, major remark that he made. And more, and more importantly, I think the more important story, and you can, I'll give it back to you here, is how many Republican senators are on board with Donald Trump and NATO? I've heard Marco Rubio and several others who I've always been huge supporters of NATO, obviously, basically saying, you know, Trump was president again. He didn't destroy NATO then. He's not going to do it now. Calm down. That's right. And it's what's happening is that basically they've been beaten into submission on the Republican side. And so has the press for that. Yeah. matter. The press just tr- the press treats Trump's various outrageous and toxic and malignant behaviors as sort of priced in. And and the standards are not the same for Trump and Biden. If Biden said remotely similarly crazy things, they would be trying to carry him out of the White House in a stretcher. Right. I mean, it's just not it's just not a fair matchup. Because we are in a situation of proto fascist ferment, basically, where where the media is kind of. I think they're hedging their bets to a great degree. I think their editors certainly are, and the owners of media very definitely are hedging their bets. But they don't want to be on the wrong side of an authoritarian if Trump wins in November. And so they're putting pressure. You hear about it at CNN, obviously at Fox, where they're trying to they're trying to set up a situation where, you know, they're not going to be public enemy number one if Trump wins. So I think that's part of it, number one. And I think that you know, if you look at if you look at it just sort of in an Cut out all the excess. Say that Biden has a significant age problem, right? Say that Trump is who Trump is. The comparison we're talking about is Biden's an old guy who sometimes misspeaks and sometimes has a like weird memory quirks. Trump is a red blooded fascist who talks about being dictator on day <laughs> one, talks about setting up camps to grab people off the streets. Who talk, you know they're they're talking about refusing to listen to the Supreme Court, basically saying, you don't, we don't like your, your judgments. Fuck you. We'll do what we want to anyway. That is a recipe for civil war. And so if you're looking at these two as two equal things, you're not, you're being, you're being meretricious. You're, you're being full of, you're full of shit because you are not really honestly looking at the risk that we have, that we have. 
with Trump versus, you know, what's the worst thing we have with Biden? Kamala Harris is president. Oh, dear God, maybe you don't like the president for two years or three years until the next election, who will act, act in a totally normal and legal way the whole time. Whereas with Trump, you are looking at, I mean, a great example, Pete, we talked, we started out talking about the convention center in D.C. Trump is talking about firing half the federal workforce. If you are a Republican, a conservative who lives in D.C. or anywhere near it, who depends on the economy of this region to have a business, a life, a career, Trump will go a long way to wrecking it completely. And yet, I know people in this town who plan to vote for Trump anyway, even though they are aware of what he will do to this city's economy if he wins. I want to ask you about Tucker Carlson's trip to Russia, where he apparently went on stage at some kind of a an event and said, I'm going to just play it in my mic. I'll, I'll drop in a better quality later. But here, here's what he said. I think this will work was radicalizing, very shocking and very disturbing for me was the city of Moscow, where I'd never been, the biggest city in Europe, 13 million people. And it is so much nicer than any city in my country. I had no idea. My father spent a lot of time there in the 80s when he worked for the U.S. government and barely had electricity. And now it is so much cleaner and safer and prettier aesthetically. It's architecture, it's food, it's service than any country and city in the United States that you have. And this is not ideological. How did that happen? How did that happen? And at a certain point, I don't think the average person cares as much about abstractions as about the concrete reality of his life. And if you can't use your subway, for example, as many people are afraid to in New York City because it's too dangerous, you have to sort of wonder, like, isn't that the ultimate measure of... All right, so that wasn't in Russia. He was at some, some other event somewhere, but he was just in... Yeah, he's Dubai. He's in Dubai, okay, yeah. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on how much better Moscow is than any city in America? It's safer, it's cleaner... Well, yeah, so I gave him, I gave Trump the, I'm sorry, I gave Tucker Carlson the Unity Valkyrie Mitford Award last week, but I'm going to have to give him the George Bernard Shaw Award this week, or the Walter Durante Award maybe, because there's a tradition or a sort of cycle of during the Nazi era, during the Stalinist era, <clears throat> excuse me, where these people, back then it was people on the left going to Russia, people on the right going to Germany, where they would go and go, oh, man, here is, like, the future. And look at how clean this place was. And look at how, like, orderly it is. And how the energy and the technology and everything else. Meanwhile, the Holodomor was happening in Ukraine. Meanwhile, in Germany, they were pushing you know, disabled, you know, disabled people into trucks and killing them with carbon monoxide. Russia is a ramshackle version of Soviet Union and or Nazi Germany. You know, Moscow is a unipole. 20% of Russians don't have an indoor toilet. You know, when you see those Russians in Ukraine, those army guys stealing toilets, guess why they're stealing those toilets? Because they don't fucking have them in Russia, right? Like if you live in the sticks, Russia is a, is a, has one city that is okay. And the rest of it's a mess. And it, then you look back at sort of Tucker Carlson talking about American cities, like, America is full of amazing cities. New York's subway and New York is one of the safest places in the United States, right? But these guys have built themselves up this, uh, guys like, like Tucker Carlson have built up this fantasy land where white rural America is safe, which frankly it is not. Places like Mississippi, rural Mississippi is one of the most dangerous parts of the United States, for instance. And, and where brown or metropolitan or cosmopolitan America, which is you know, a, a, a air quotes way to say Jewish people are the ones who live in this dangerous, scary, frightening place. And, you know, for Carlson to do that, I mean, it's such a cliche for somebody to go to a dictatorship and do that, that I would think even he would have been smart enough not to. But I think he's a wholly owned subsidiary at this point of whatever fascist will come along and support him. Yeah, there's you're saying that that people have done this in the past. They've gone to other countries and, and praised them. George Bernard Shaw, the guy who wrote Pygmalion, went to Russia. He, you know, Unity Mitford and a bunch of people from England and America. Henry Ford went and got medals from the Nazis. I mean, you know, uh, Elon Musk is not far behind, I'm sure. You know, it's it, this is the thing that these people who are reactionaries or radicals, they always go to these places 
and pay no attention to the dead body behind right. the curtain because it doesn't fit what they want, the, the argument they want to make when they get back to the U.S. What do you make of the immigration debate and the bill written by Republicans, then voted against by Republicans, a bill that was more extreme, had more money for security than anything that we'd ever seen before, a bill that if it had passed, Democrats who care about the immigration issue would have really been very critical of Biden and Democrats for even working on it because it was really not much of a compromise. And it was such an extreme bill, and yet Republicans still killed it. And most analysts and, and commentators are saying it had a lot to do with Donald Trump, their dear leader, telling them to kill it. They didn't want to get anything done under Biden. Let's not secure the border under Biden. Let Wait till I get there. And we certainly have seen this over and over, by the way, with Obama, again, with Biden, like holding the country's economy hostage until the election, holding the Supreme Court nomination hostage until the election. So it's not it's not really new, but and neither is demagoguing and not wanting to have any solutions for immigration and, and rather have it continue to be a problem to divide people and to to win elections on and get ratings and all of that. But I mean, this one does seem pretty audacious and it's it is kind of fascinating to watch the Republican senators be against the very conservative, for example, Border Patrol union it's a federal government agency their union has been you know made fun of by on publicly on on their twitter account so what are your what are your thoughts on that negotiation and and what it means because i think it'll be effective I, th- I don't think it'll hurt republicans i think that people that care about the border and immigration that say they do don't really understand it and i think they'll probably be fine with this so i don't agree actually i here's for a couple of reasons number one they, you're right it was a bill that the republicans in their dreams could not have hoped for the guy who wrote most of it, who did most of the negotiating, Lankford from, I want to say, Oklahoma, super conservative yeah. guy. He pushed for an extremely tough bill and he got it. And what happened is that the Democrats made themselves made a calculation. Calculation was we can fix things about this bill later if we get a majority back. But we need aid to Taiwan, Ukraine and Israel now. The other calculation they're making is that the border does hurt Democrats. I was not in favor of most of that bill. At the same time, the political logic of it made tons yeah. of sense. Because if you can get that, get the border, you're going to have Biden on there saying, hey, we did this. We did this. Would he have some people pissed off at him? Sure. Would it hurt him in the general election? No, it probably helps him. What the Republicans did, though, is they blew the game. They're burned from Dobbs. They know that getting what they wanted on Dobbs actually hurt them. And they were over, trying to abortion of, hurt them. They got what they wanted. Turning over, over abortion has 100 percent hurt them. No question. And what they were terrified of was, again, getting what they wanted, because if they got this border bill with Democrats signing on and saying, here you go, we all did this. It, it takes the wind out of their sails on a bunch of the border issues and immigration. And here but here's where they're really stupid. They overtly said that Mike Johnson said it overtly, said it was at Trump's orders in effect. Trump himself said, I told them not to do it, and they didn't do it. Lankford has been going around saying, someone asked him, how did it feel to get pushed under the bus? And he said, oh, no, no, not just pushed under, but backed over again. They they so like ham-handedly overshot and were too obvious about it that is the the border and is immigration going to hurt Democrats as fall short? Is it going to hurt them as much as it would have? I don't think so. I think that it's very easy to say, here was the bill. We tried to do it. These clowns wouldn't. And and what's really important about it is the centrality of Trump to nothing getting done is overt and clear and obvious. That Trump doesn't want to fix the border as long as it doesn't help him. His his narcissism, political narcissism and and egoism full display. Now, does that hurt him with MAGA people? No. But I got to tell you something. I've been talking to people who I think are on the fence and I'm like, look, if you have this guy around, it's always going to be bullshit. It's always going to be about him. And that doesn't that hurts him. That does hurt him. You know, I'd rather be Biden in this campaign than Trump, whatever Biden's negatives and age and everything else. Trump, I, I don't see Trump getting far north of 46 percent in almost any case. So it'll really be about whether people show up for Biden or don't vote for 
you know, the, that vaccine lunatic and Kennedy <laughs> or in, or in the sexual assaulting guy who owns half a million dollars in child support, Cornell West. I, right. Like, I didn't know that. You didn't know that about Cornell West? Nope. Oh, Cornell West owes, owes like half a million dollars in child Yikes. support. Cheated on every woman he's been oh. with. He's a Cornell West is an absolute wow. sexist piece oh, of crap. No. He, he calls Trump brother Trump, and it's pretty yeah, clearly like one. They have the same attitude towards women. Oh, wow. Did not know that. Yeah. And by the way, these are things that do you really think the Biden ministry, uh, the Biden campaign is going to let all this be only the knowledge of somebody like me? No, this is going to be billion and a half dollars worth of ads are going to be pounding these messages. Uh, into people's Bobby heads. Kennedy. I'd rather do Biden. There's an ad at the Super Bowl last night that was a kind of take off the that. JFK presidential ad. Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. And so somehow, yeah. I guess some of his family members, Kennedys, were mad that that they ran that ad because it was kind of appropriating the JFK campaign. I, how dare you? I guess. I don't know. I don't know why it's such a big deal. Sure. And by but, the way, it was paid for by one of the Mellons, who is a huge, huge Trump supporter. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, and, I thought that he's more of a threat to Trump. RFK. His, we'll, we'll see. Okay, but the bottom line but is, it was a Trump guy. Thing. I want to make the petty point that is being missed, which is uh, obviously that was a horrible thing to see during the Super Bowl. As, as soon as I see him or an ad i I think anti-vax and i also think speaking of creep around women like that dude is reputation go ahead look into it folks but but he's like apologizing to us i'm sorry if anybody was offended that i use you know that that, but he said i'm sorry if anybody was offended that was my super pack i have nothing to do with that ad he was and then it was his pinned tweet he was literally on his website yeah promoting the ad that's like, I had nothing to do with it. It's just so that kind of a thing is so I, I, I guess it's hard to be shocked any anymore, but it's like, I had nothing to do with it. Here it is. I would like to share it with you. Right. Yeah. And, and by the way, sorry, Jack Kennedy sorry to my brothers and sisters and cousins. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he is a gross person that Jack Kennedy would have maybe, maybe don't run for office. Right. And and Jack Kennedy would have repudiated every single thing that this idiot yeah. says. He would have hated him. So it's just gross. It's just, you know, it's <clears throat> if his father, I'm if his fa- Bobby, what family wasn't who they line, Bobby. Yeah, exactly. it's audio. It's, that's pretty if good. JFK and RFK had lived, yeah. that's actual audio. For, Bobby, get th- this kid's fucking, he's, uh, he's crazy. What's he talking about? <laughs> You're kind of slipping between New England and upstate New York. Nailing it. I just got a ton of feedback from listeners just now. They say, wow, nailed it. <laughs> really, yeah. really. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, but it, it's super gross. And you're right, though. It is. It tells you where we are. You know, people talk about, like, decadence, right? That's decadence, political decadence. That people like this, I don't mean this in any sort of moral sense. I mean it in, like, a cultural sense where people can be completely full of shit. Total liars. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't knock them out of the race. It doesn't hurt them at all. They can do whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. Trump does that. And again, you know, we're talking about our media and Trump earlier. And look what's happening. Trump is saying and doing absolutely insane things. And the media kind of likes it because it gets them clicks and makes them money. Let's go to the issue of. What was the last issue I wanted to talk with you about? The rigged the war in Ukraine, rigged Super Bowl. Yeah, let's talk about the war in Ukraine and the latest. There, I talked about it with yesterday with David Rothkopf, of course. So will there be funding from Congress for Ukraine, and and what is going on over there? Uh, Zelensky relieved his top general. That guy might run against him. It seems like there's a, a, a divide forming, and that can't be good. So I disagree no, with I that. I, mean, um, I just saw, I read one. Yeah, no, no, like, no, no, I know. Yeah. No, but most of the reporting is, <clears throat> most of the reporting is like, oh my God, this is a disaster. Zaluzhny is the best and, you know, whatever. You know, whatever. Zaluzhny has been f- leading a war from its first desperate moments for the last two and a half years. Guys like that get two hours of sleep a night, three hours of sleep a night. They are, they have a, multiplicity of unsolvable dilemmas that get thrown into their faces every day. And it's the basically the most difficult crushing job you could ever possibly do. 
and most people can't do it for very long. Right. It, it makes sense for, for Zelensky to move Zeluzhny out. And Zeluzhny, by the way, was going around Zelensky to the public. And Zelensky was saying, well, we can't do 500,000 mobilization. And Zeluzhny was going to the public and saying, well, no, actually, we need to do that. We need to do this. We need to do that. The bottom line is that is a country run by civilians. It is not a military dictatorship. If the president of Ukraine is not confident and can't get the complete, you know, obedience from his commanding in chief, his army, then he needs to fire. It's a, it's a country that has votes that elects leaders. The military does just like here does not get to say, no, we have a different view of the war than the president does. And Zeluzhny was doing that. And I don't think that there was a big political divide. I don't think, I don't think Zeluzhny is trying to become president, at least not right away. When, when the ceremony, when he turned over command, he hugged, he kept hugging Zelensky. He looked relieved mm-hmm. to be out of there. Another thing that is going on is that the general took over a guy whose name I'm going to mispronounce, but I think it's Zerinsky. He is not popular with the troops. And that was another thing. Oh, they're going to kill the morale of the troops. The Ukrainian troops love Zeluzhny. This is going to ruin their morale. I'll tell you a little anecdote. My great-great-grandfather was in Company A of the 1st New Jersey Infantry and was in, in, from the, in the Civil War in every single debacle that George McClellan, who's commander of the Union Armies in the first half of the war, ever got in. And boy, McClellan got into some real bad debacles. My great-great-grandfather fought under him in all of them. He was out of the war after Antietam, never went back. Grant comes in eventually and wins the war. My great-great-grandfather went to his grave saying George McClellan was the best general ever, even though he was losing the war. Why? McClellan was terrified of losing men. He hated losing men. And so if you're a guy on the line, you love that guy. He's never going to put me in a position where he loses anybody you know, that doesn't absolutely need to die. Now, Grant, Grant was liked by his men, but he wasn't loved. Why? Because he was willing to say, you know what, boys? A lot of you are going to get killed today to win this war. And that is how you win war. Sentiment doesn't do it. And so on a lot of different levels, what hap- what's happening in Ukraine now is okay. The war has turned into one where defense is now paramount. Ukraine needs to conserve its strength, build up, and get aid to the point where at some point they can wear the Russians down to where, where maybe maneuver warfare comes back. That's what they need to concentrate on. I'm not sure Zeluzhny was the man for that job. And I think that he was a wonderful leader for a very long time, right up to the end. But he looked like somebody who had been, hadn't slept in months. And you need to change these things out. We change generals out constantly in World War II. It's totally okay and it's fine. Now, when you come to aid for Ukraine, that change is being used in Washington as a way to say we shouldn't give them aid because they don't, they're having all kinds of turmoil. You know why I think that's ridiculous, but what's happening now is that the Senate is going to pass that bill Wednesday, 67 votes. So it's going to pass unfilibusterable level. Yeah. But and it's going to go back to the House. And the House. There's a guy named Gallagher, Wisconsin, a Wisconsin House member who is quite a good guy. Quite a good guy. Republican? Very, very. I don't agree with his politics. He is a Republican. I don't agree with his politics, but on Ukraine and all the rest, he is excellent. Hmm. Oh, this is Gallagher one. just announced his retirement. Well, that's is he a Trump, well, is he a Trump supporter? No, no, he voted for. I think he voted for impeachment, and he's he's very critical of Trump on a lot of ways. Good. Gallagher is retiring. Look for him to put a discharge position on the floor of the House. What does that mean? To get that bill through. Oh, discharge okay. position is when you basically force, force the vote because the yeah. speaker the, generally has the ability to, to decide what gets a vote and what doesn't. And, yes. and in this case and in other cases in the past, it's always interesting when the speaker That's doesn't right. take bring the bill to the House because they know it will pass. They don't want it to pass. That's right. And so that's right. Boehner did all the Boehner time. did it all the time. I did it on immigration. I know that. Are they? Yeah. So 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 I don't have any inside knowledge. But what Gallagher is doing and suddenly retiring, right? It's announcing his retirement right before this bill is going to end up in the House. I have a suspicion that he is at least going to be part of the plot, if not the prime mover to get a discharge position, sorry, petition through. And so I would say 50-50 for Ukraine aid, and it could never come soon enough. 
about Ukraine aid, by the way, one last thing I will say. Trump explicitly does not want it to go through. So we can circle back to your your feeling that Trump is trying to help Putin. I think he explicitly wants Ukraine to lose. And I think that if he becomes president again, that's another Ukraine will be part of be a Russian satellite. And the potential for World War Three will skyrocket. Sounds like uh, what Rothkopf said. I think it's a really that's the low bar what analysis your, of things. I don't think what is your biggest concern or what keeps you up at night in terms of the election? Anything is possible. There's a above zero chance that Donald Trump could be president again. Most of us don't think I think a lot of you know people pay close attention. A lot of people I respect do not think there's a very high chance that he's going to win the amount of electoral votes that he needs to win. But that doesn't, you know, I mean, that means he wouldn't be president, but it doesn't mean there wouldn't be, you know, still insurrections and, 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 and violence potentially because he'll say that, again, it was rigged and I'd be pretty pissed if I believed that. But what what keeps you, what what pathway do you see that, you know, do you least sleep, sleep over or think is, is the one to be most concerned about third party, this state, something else? Unpredictable. No, I think a serious Biden health crisis is the big, a serious Biden health crisis is the big problem. If Biden um, health crisis, that terrifies me. Yeah, Biden has a serious health crisis. I think it throws things really up in the air. I think I think Harris is unfairly maligned, but life's not fair, and I don't think that you know I don't think she would. But I think she'd have trouble getting elected. At least a few listeners resonated with them. Is it not? I don't know what the political science. Or scientists say about this, but isn't it just, aren't we voting many of us against Donald Trump? I'm not voting for Joe Biden. I'm just, I'm going to vote to make sure that Donald Trump doesn't be president. I don't care who's on the ballot. A listener emailed me and I said, if it was a, a, a rat, a sick rat, I would vote for the sick rat. It would do far less damage. So is that not a fair, people are so motivated against this horrible person being president again. So we don't know, though, whether those people are enough relative to the people who won't get off the couch. Mm -hmm. And that is what scares me. That that worries me. I don't know how many people are just going to turn themselves off. You know, I hear it it astonishes me when I hear 25 year olds say, I can't believe Biden didn't get rid of all of my debt, my college debt. And I'm like, whoa, he got rid of one hundred and seventy five million of debt or whatever, some crazy number of it that it didn't wasn't you personally and isn't his fault and you're not going to vote for him on that basis. It's insane. Or, or the people, Muslims that I know, I mean, Wajahat Ali seems to have backed off of this, but a lot of Muslims I know who are like, Oh, I'd rather vote for Trump over Biden because of Gaza. Well, he never said he never said rather vote. He did not No, he kind of, he kind of danced around it and then he backed that way from it. I will be to be clear, but I know a fair number of Muslim people who I know, not just Muslims, who say they're going to not vote at all because what would be the difference between Trump and Biden? Yeah. And that is just absolutely insane. Trump would be vastly worse. And I think that in this well, election, a man on those people coming into America. So like it, Oh, no, he would do worse. He would do worse. He would do far worse. That. He would tell the Israelis. I have to ask some Muslim folks to, to, to help me understand. Like somebody can, is going to have to explain that to me. Cause I, I can't understand. I can understand being really upset about the Biden administration's policy. I'm, really upset about it. I think it's a tough situation. I don't think it's an easy situation, yeah. both in terms yeah. of messaging and, you know, it's one thing to, to to dress down the prime minister behind the scenes and clearly Biden hates the guy, but, you know, he hasn't changed any policy towards him. I get that. I get those complaints and I, I think something absolutely needs to be changed. And I'm not the only one with a lot of people inside the Biden administration that are saying this, but he, yeah. the last guy banned Muslims. He banned them. Well, and banned them. And, you know, Trump would be fine if if Netanyahu bulldozed all those people sure. into the Mediterranean Sea. He would yes, care. he would, he would, he would, he would care. fill the bulldozer. Well, you'd have someone fill the bulldozer with gas. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so the but so this is what concerns me beyond a health care for Biden. What concerns me is how people are, to be blunt, not acting like fucking grownups. They're saying, "Oh, I'm not getting exactly what I want." So yeah, I'm not going to vote. Prop. Versus okay. sometimes in life. There's the shit sandwich where the, it's only about a quarter inch of shit in it, and you've got the shit sandwich that's yeah. half. You know, half a I foot learned. Thick, I learned that. You've got I learned that so well about politics. I was really disabused by Dr. Aaron Carroll, 
on the, on the healthcare debate because mm-hmm. it would just always say that we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. He'd always be critical of when we had to, the trade offs and the things we had to give up and what that meant. But right. he still wanted to see something get done, and it did. And it's been yeah. you know it's the perfect example because it's it, it saved hundreds, millions of Americans' lives and made the rest of our lives a lot easier and more affordable, that bill. And so so oh, yeah. you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good on, on any policy, and that's what politics is, that's what governing is. That's- yeah, I mean, it's being an adult in the society you live in. Yeah. And, and you know, a good example, you and I remember the people who were furious there wasn't single payer. Single I was payer one of them. In- I was one of them. And I couldn't, at the time, I can remember just being like, this isn't it like what we're getting is something we never expected to get. It's the, it's the old Louis CK thing where he talks about being on the airplane the first time they had Wi-Fi, and they tell them, hey, you have, we're experimenting doing Wi-Fi in the plane. He says, the plane takes off, and 20 minutes into the flight, me and the guy next to me are like on our computers, and then it, it turns off again. And the guy next to him is like, oh, Jesus Christ, I can't believe this. And Louis CK's joke is that, you know, obviously Louis CK has his problems, but his joke is, you're sitting in a plane... 20,000 feet off the ground, eating a Salisbury steak, crossing a continent that would have taken you months and half of you would have died a hundred years ago. And you're mad that you don't get Wi-Fi. That's like, and, but he said, you know, that's classic us. Like we get something that's totally like fantastic, but not, not, but we're we're pissed if we can't keep it, even though we didn't care about it half an hour ago before it existed. And that is our politics yeah. right now. No, I mean, it's interesting to see that even at the local level, our board of education, our fight, you know, I don't agree with many of the board members that I'm supporting. I don't agree with the superintendent that I, but I appreciate the hell yeah. out of the vast majority of what they're doing. And it's like, I wouldn't burn someone down because I didn't agree with just this part of, of their agenda or, or another part, because you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But that's not how you get ratings. It's not how you get elected. It's not how you make friends. It's not how yeah, you get and- well, it is how you get elected. Actually, it is how you get elected. Elections are coalitions, right? And the oh, reason no, that's no. a reason that extremists, yes. but the reason extremists like Tucker Carlson hates the subway, right? Is because by his nature, he does not want to have to compromise with, with people around him or with people that are different from him or someone who might be a little disturbing in their opinions, dress, smell, habits, whatever. That's why these people hate cities. It's why they hate subways. It's it's why Elon Musk thinks mass transit is so terrible. Because it forces them to compromise. Share. In many big ways. Share space. Ways. Share anything. And, yeah. and, right. And, 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 you know, they don't get their own preferences all the time. That's, that's not a bad definition for MAGAism. No, yeah, no. It's like, it's, 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 it's like kindergarten. But, yeah. And they want what they want. And, you know, there's a reason that most MAGA people are not poor. Most of them make about 100 grand a year as a family unit. They are the petty bourgeois middle class. They are the people who they can see what it would be like to be rich enough to never have to worry about anybody else's opinion. But they'll never be that. And at the same time, they're terrified of sliding down into being poor where they have to where they have to compromise in how they live their day to day. Before I let you go, I want to mention one more thing. And I'm only doing this as a way to be virtuous and tell everybody I gave blood yesterday. But nice. I saw one of the MAGA people on Facebook who hates me mention there was a blood drive <laughs> yesterday. Like, hey, get blood at the Catholic Church. And I was like, so I, I know she hates me. So I was like, thanks for the heads up. And then I sent her a picture of me giving blood. She's like, thanks for your donation. So I was at the church. I haven't been into mm-hmm. a Catholic Church in a while. Obviously, I grew up in one, did all the things and not all the things, but a lot of the things. And so I walk out of the, you know, where the, the basement where they were taking the blood, the Red Cross volunteers were, or I don't think they're volunteers, people were. And I walk right into the sermon. It was Sunday. And the priest is there in his dress, wearing it like they wear a wizard. It's called an Abba. It's called an Abba, folks. It's but a ahead. nightgown. <laughs> And he's saying, I, I don't remember growing up in the church, the church, Catholic churches I went to, I would have appreciated if they had a personal message of any kind, but it was, it was always boilerplate. It seemed like it was just, I felt like every, every week was almost the same exact thing. 
I never really heard any of their own thoughts. And I always wondered, like, are they not allowed to? And then, you know, in other, I go to other churches and the, you know, the minister in this case, a Presbyterian church or Methodist, they have all kinds of shit to say about their lives and anecdotes and get laughs. It was like they're, you know, black churches. I mean, like, it's the, but the Catholic church always say, anyway, this priest, this is what I heard him say. When men think about sex, it's physical. When women think about sex, it's emotional. And it was everything I could do. This Catholic yes. priest who doesn't probably have everything a ton of I could personal. do. Standing in the back of the church, first thing I did is I looked around to see who the people were that were that were listening to this person. And then I just wanted to scream, How would you know? How would you know? Right. Why why are you talking about this in church on a Sunday? Why is this part of your and then he went on to say Later on, and then he just said the the re, the top reason for affairs is boredom, and I was just like, and then he suggested a date night, which I thought was nice, but it was so unbelievably mm. offensive to both men who have strong emotional connections to their female partners and women who have strong physical connections to their male. Like what? Like it, it just it was so simplified, and it was so you know hard to hear from from that priest. So I just needed to tell you about my experience and for else, well, so them two things. number number one I, I grew up in a, a very different experience to catholic church i grew up around priests who were hilarious and cool my priests, and were funny. My priests had a sense days. of humor i mean they were they were obviously covering pedophiles so in retrospect pretty absurd yeah, i mean yeah I, I i at the beach went to a uh, priest that was run by franciscan monks and they were like used to surf with them it was great yeah. they were good you know yeah, just awesome guys saying. but yeah so, so there's like, well, so there's the, like a Catholic church, like democratic the party. There's sure, a lot in the service where they freelance. Pre, yeah. Pre ball? Yeah. 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 Not, not very dry. Some were, but most were not. Always felt like always also been. probably ethnic though. It was like Italian and Catholic. So I'm sorry, Italian and Irish. Yeah, that's who I was. So maybe a little more. That's where I was. I was all, I, I was all Italian, Irish, Catholic church. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. It, it just, I just, it, then it was just certain. I, mean, I, mean, I didn't have the that. Idea the idea of the priest talking about sex. In front of children, uh, well, that was and my being, second. And in such a binary way, or at all, I was shocked. I was, sh- I mean, and it's a weird thing to just sample. Yeah. Like again, I haven't been a Catholic church in years and years, and that's the, and I, that's what I heard. I was like, wow, and I just made me super curious about how common that is and how much he talks about that. And then I looked around at the folks there, and I just the judgments that I was making were so unbelievably harsh and unfair. Nice. One guy walked up. So here's where that seems really His hands were dragging right on the aisle. I couldn't even believe how his knuckles literally. Nice. So here's where that seems strange to me, and it's going to be from a direction you probably are not going to expect. A defense of the Catholic Church? What could be more. What? How could a relationship towards sex be more emotional than if you chose to be celibate for the rest (laughs) of your life? (laughs) Right? I mean, seriously, that's an incredible. Like, your relationship to your sexuality is incredibly emotional. That's. That is not a decision you make out of cool intellectual mm-hmm. judgment. You decide that you are going to commit yourself in an emotional way to the church for the rest of your life and not have mm-hmm. sex with anybody. So I would say that that priest probably <laughs> needs to work married. on his self understanding. Probably married is what it is. Or that, yes, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. The same to do. Any well, of us would about men and women. I, I hope he. Yeah, personally, I hope he is married. If it's a dude, that's cool by me too. You know, like I, I wish him that all the. All the best All the, possible emotional outcomes. You know, ever. I'm having, having but, this fight. I'm in the fight now, and now it's over LGBT. Stuff. Right, and that. it's one of the things that a lot a lot of the parents are saying, and not a, one of them was going to do this, but, you know, some of them are saying, I'm, that's it with our public schools. I'm sending my kid to the Catholic school. And I'm just like, listen, I'm right. not saying. Because there won't be any LGBT I'm not there. saying your kid's going to get gonna get molested. At the Catholic school. I'm not saying that. I just think it's weird that you're worried about a trans kid assaulting your child, a trans girl coming in the bathroom and assaulting your child. You're worried right. more about that than a priest. That's all I'm saying. Like risk assessment. Right. Right. <laughs> you're going well, to yeah, be any like, gay I've or trans met. kids in the Catholic church. So in the Catholic. Yeah, I've never met. I've never met anyone more screwed up about their sexuality. Than a conservative person trying to deny what their oh, sexuality yeah. yep. is, and it's so so right. common. Yeah, like, I almost assume it now yeah, when I hear it, someone screaming anti-gay stuff. I pretty much go right to it. I'm like, that guy is like 
just one Michelob Ultra from a dick. I've always, I've always felt yeah. the same. Yeah, that no doth protest too much, as uh, our buddy Billy Shakespeare yeah. would say. <laughs> Yeah, so. All right, man. Awesome as always. Appreciate you whenever you're able to join me. Really good stuff. Awesome. Yeah. There he goes. Bill Boyle, what do you think? Let him know you heard him here on the show. He's usually at our hangouts on Thursday nights. You can find him in several other ways as well. A lot of folks have made friends with Bill. Good friend of mine. I'm always happy when he joins our conversation. Coming up this week, I still got uh, author Matt Gallagher. He's got a new book out. I'm planning to talk to Wajahat Ali, S.E. Cup, and who else would you like to hear from? I can reach out and get him on the show and let me know. Thank you, Bumblebees, here at the end. I love you. Email me, standupapete at gmail.com, and I will be right back here tomorrow in your ears. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, oh, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans for a stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up you got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the dark